would like to support the efforts and research we are doing here on this podcast, make a donation using the Buy Me A Coffee link in the show notes or go to buymeacoffee.com slash Shane's Brain. Thank you. Aphantasia is a condition characterized by an inability to visualize mental images in one's mind. If you have just discovered that you or someone you love has aphantasia, or if you're just fascinated by the subject in general and love learning more about it, you are in the right place. The Discovering Your Mind podcast delves into all aspects of the mind's eye, including aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and everything in between. Welcome to the Discovering Your Mind podcast, brought to you by Shane'sBrainDomain.com. I am your host, Shane Williams, also known as Shane's Brain. And today we're talking with the one and only Sarah Pett, who I used to run around the hills of Idaho with when we were kids. Very right? true. Very true. Yes. Well, thank you for that grand introduction. <laughs> yeah. Good times. Good times. Really good times, actually. Lots of fun things. Family reunions, yeah. the best. Whole other episode or whole other topic, I guess. Yes, there were some good family reunions for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't you tell us what you do for a living? Okay. So I currently am the owner of SP Upstaging Homes. I stage homes with furniture, art, furnishings, basically decorate a home, but not in the same way an interior designer does. Uh, An interior designer is decorating for one specific person, but I'm staging a home to sell. So I have to decorate a home in a way that appeals to as many people as possible and also portray certain, you know, ideas or images in people's minds that will translate into their perception of the value of the home, the cleanliness of the home, the usefulness of the home. So my background is actually in marketing and advertising. So I feel like every time I'm staging a home, I am creating an ad, just painting pictures, like I was telling you, painting pictures in people's minds of what this home could be for them so they can visualize themselves in that space. Okay, very cool. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about that later, I think. And uh, what about what about other stuff, other hobbies and interests? I am a photographer. In 2009, I started doing photography and I actually got into it because I really wanted to do macro photography and art and nature photography and things like that. Turns out bugs don't pay you to take their pictures. So I ended up getting into portraits and wedding photography and did some commercial work and things like that. So I do that. I've done, I start a lot of businesses and I read a ton of books. I love audiobooks. I listen to audiobooks constantly and just researching and learning new things. I feel like I've been to the University of YouTube many times on many subjects. I, I probably have many degrees in YouTube learning. I love YouTube. So my favorite thing is to play with my grandkids. We do a lot of pretend play. <laughs> All right. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to grandkids. I don't have any yet, but it's getting closer. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure I was born to be a grandpa. So I'm, I, I'm I right. feel like that's true. <laughs> Everything <laughs> I know about you, I feel like you were born to be a grandpa. <laughs> it's the best thing anyone can ever do with their life is be a grandparent, I think. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the apple graph. If you would like to view the apple graph to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the Aphantasia and Beyond section. If you are unable to view the apple graph for whatever reason, it is a graph divided into six sections. In the number six section, there is a very detailed image of a red apple. In the number five section, it is the same image but with less detail. Number four is still in color but has less detail and more basic shapes instead of detailed hues and gradients. Number three is the less detailed apple, but in gray tones without the color. Number two is a simple outline of the apple. And number one is blank, indicating no visualization whatsoever. This is called aphantasia. The first thing I want you to do is imagine a red apple in your mind. Okay. All right, now take a look at that apple graph that I sent you. Okay. And... Let me know which one of those best represents what you pictured in your mind. The very last one, but mine's far superior. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I had a feeling. Uh, I I think you might be what we call hyperphantasia. 
very extreme, vivid detail, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, so that would be a, a number six on the Apple graph or possibly a, a 12. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have you heard of aphantasia before I mentioned it? Um, I know you're familiar with the concept. Yeah. So, yeah, as I was telling you, I, I've i contemplated the concept of, you know, people visualizing or not being able to visualize things in different degrees, but I never knew there was a term for it. I certainly didn't know there was a condition for it. I always kind of thought, you know, they just don't have any real practice doing this. Their job doesn't require it. Their childhood, childhood didn't encourage it, you know. Some, for some reason, they just never practice this. Like, you know, they say everything's a muscle in your brain and your body, you know, anything you practice, you can get better at. And so that was just always kind of my, my thinking is that, you know, these, I, I hear from people all the time. I just can't visualize myself living here. I don't know if my furniture will fit in this space. I, you know, they walk into a room and I, they can't think of any way to solve the problems or the issues that are there. And so I just thought, you know, well, because they've never tried. <laughs> right. They don't do it all the time. So they, they're they not used to doing it. So. All right. Well, um, one of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast is kind of uh, trying to have an open mind mm -hmm. and uh, trying to understand that, you know, not everybody is having the same experiences and what they're telling me is valid it's because some people do just dismiss it. Oh, that can't be real. Yeah. But I can assure well, you it's real. Well, I'm telling you, you are opening my mind. I didn't know there was such a thing that people literally could not see it. I'm still just mind blown by the concept. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next thing I would like you to do is imagine a horse in your mind. Okay. Is it like looking at a picture or more of just a thought or something else? I think more like a video. It's like looking at a video. Okay. Or, or yeah. being there and seeing it, you know? Right, like you're actually yeah. there? Okay. Yeah. Is the image more clear with your eyes closed or your eyes open? I think with them closed. I think I kind of naturally do that without realizing it, that you tell me to visualize something and I kind of close my eyes and go into that space. But Okay. Can you visualize it at all with your eyes open? Yeah, I can, but I'm definitely distracted by the things around me more. Okay. It's it's kind of makes it go in and out as I'm distracted, I think. All right. Uh, would you say you see the horse in your mind or is it projected out in front of you? Uh, I feel like it's out in front of me. I feel like I, I, I mean, maybe not like in the way that a projector works or a hologram, but when I see it, I, I feel like I see myself. Well, I don't see myself. I'm just in the space and it's in front of me as if it's there. So I guess in my mind, I have this world that I'm in and it's in and we are in it together. <laughs> if that makes any sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, is the image solid or transparent? Solid. Is it in color or black and white? Color. Are the colors vibrant or muted? Vibrant. Is it 2D or 3D? 3D. And when you first pictured it, was it still or was there movement? Movement. All right. Was it just running around or what was happening? Well, it was standing in front of me and as horses do, just kind of moving its head and breathing. I could see light shining on its coat and, you know, going over its muscles as it moved and its hair kind of moving and falling as it moves its head, things like that. Oh, awesome. Great details. Was the horse isolated or was there a background? It was in a space where I could tell there was grass beneath it and an open space behind it, but I wasn't really focusing on that. So I wouldn't know if there were lots of trees or anything. I just noticed that there was in a grassy space closely in front of me, mostly taking up my full view. Okay. Can you put a birthday hat on the horse if you want? Sure. As you're <clears throat> asking me, I'm thinking I can just imagine what other people might be saying and how different they would be seeing it. And again, I, I never contemplated that anyone would be not seeing anything still blows my mind but so i'm assuming you can make the horse run if you want to yeah all right what about sound if it made a sound could you hear it in your mind for sure yeah uh, now i want you to imagine a cup on a table that you accidentally okay. knock over okay all right what type of cup was it 
It was one of those red cups that everybody has, you know, like picnic picnic cups, the plastic red, red ones. solo cup. Yeah, a solo cup. Yeah. All right. What about the table? What type of table was it? It was a brown wood table, like a kind of a dark wood country style table. Okay. And how did the cup get knocked over? It just knocked over with my mind. Nothing happened. You told me to knock it over. You didn't tell me to put something there to knock it over. So it just tipped over okay. on its own. And when it knocked over, did anything spill out of it? Yes, there was a liquid that poured out of it. It was not clear, maybe apple juice or something. It just oh, okay. splashed up and then fell off the table, right? It was sitting right at the edge. So it kind of splashed up and then fell over and spilled on the floor. Did this sequence appear as a video in your mind or something else? Kind of like a video, yeah. Okay. And again, what about sound? Did you hear the sound? Did you hear it crash and stuff like that? Uh, I was really focused on the visual part of it. I feel like I kind of heard the, you know how you flick those cups or you hear them and they kind of make that like sound like that weird hollow plasticky right. sound. So maybe at the beginning, but by the time it had fallen, I had kind of you know, moved past to hear what you were saying next. So I wasn't paying attention. So no. This question was developed in order to see what, see what details the mind will automatically fill in when the details aren't given. Oh, wow. So do you know why your mind filled in the details that it filled in? Cause I said cup tables knocked over. That's yeah. all I said, but you got other details. So do you know why your mind went yeah. to those things? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I feel like those cups, everyone, well, I have had a lot of experience with those cups. We actually have some that we use for minute to win it games where we do a lot of things with the cups and they tilt and fall over and things like that. The table is something I was just thinking about using for home I'm staging today. And so it's just the table I already had in my mind quickly. And um, the juice is probably maybe because I have some apple juice that I've been meaning to do something with because I don't want to drink it because I just started a diet. <laughs> okay. All right. So it sounds like your mind kind of gravitates toward things you're familiar with. Yeah. Or frequently thinking about or recently thinking about. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about the mind audio. Uh, do you have an inner monologue? All the time. Will not shut up. Okay. Yeah. Is that in your voice? Sometimes, I guess. I, I think it depends on what it is I'm thinking. I have arguments in my head with people, and I think they have their voice and I have mine, you know. Or if I'm thinking about, I don't know, a movie or a video or whatever, I hear it in that voice. Like, it replays in my mind as it was originally, you know. Okay. So I think if I'm talking to myself about something, it's probably in my voice. Would you say there's always something audible going on in your mind? Most of the time, probably, yeah. Are sounds automatically attached to your visualization, or are they optional? I want to say they're optional, and I think it really depends on if, um, like when you were asking me to visualize something, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm seeing something only, so I'm working on the visual aspect of that. But right. if you were asking me to remember a horse-eyed scene, before, it would come with the sounds that were associated with that scene. You're a wonderful dancer, she said with a smile, as I shimmied and shuffled and boogied with style. Thank you, I stammered. I appreciate that. But I just need to know where the bathroom is at. All mixed up, a motley horde of funny poems is available on shanesbraindomain.com and Amazon. So when you have a song stuck in your head, is it like listening to the radio? Well, with gaps, because <laughs> I get songs stuck in my head and they'll play over and over, but only to the degree that I remember and know the song. So just like if you forget the words or remember them wrong, that plays over in my head over and over and over. I, I wish I could just say the whole song comes back to me and I know all the words, <laughs> but that's not what happens. So just, just out of curiosity... On a scale from one to 10, how close is that to reality? If you compare it to actually hearing something on the radio versus mm. your imagination of it, how close to reality is it? 
I think it really determines on the attention, focus, or effort that I'm giving to it. If it's just something that I can't seem to stop and I'm trying to push to the back while I do other things, it's just kind of a, you know, like an intrusion, an annoying, fuzzy background noise kind of thing that just keeps popping up. But if I were really trying to remember a song and think about it, if I focused on it, I'd hear the music, I'd hear the song in the person's voice with the fluctuations of their voice. Like it becomes more like something you'd hear on the radio. Okay, very cool. Thank you for that. Now let's talk about the other senses a little bit. Okay. So uh, now I want you to imagine a chocolate chip cookie in your mind. Okay. Can you smell it in your mind? No, I don't think so. I mean, I could think about what it should smell like, but I don't think I've ever smelt something in my visions or, you know, my mind's eye. Now that you mention it, that is weird. Okay. Not that yeah. I can think of. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. A lot of people can, and it's on different levels again. Um, huh. But I, I can't at all. I don't have any of the senses in my mind. None of them. Wow. Well, it's interesting. Which some people then ask, how do you think? <laughs> but, <laughs> That's funny. Which is hard to describe, actually. All right. Still with the chocolate chip cookie. Can you taste it in your mind? Mm, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Again, on a scale of one to 10, how real is it? Can you describe it? Uh, I definitely don't feel like that as, as strong as visualization. I can, if I think about it and focus on it, like have the sensation of, oh, I'm tasting it and it's chocolatey and it's warm and soft, all the things I love about a cookie. But I kind of feel like it do, it's not, it's just not the same as eating a cookie. So I don't, wouldn't say it's super realistic. It's okay. almost, yeah, like I'm making it up. <laughs> okay. I mean, so, in my mind, you know what I mean? It's like I'm convincing myself this is what it tastes like, you know. What about the sense of touch? Can you touch it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it in your hands? Like I can... I feel like in my mind, I can make myself do all of those things. I could make myself pick it up. I could make myself eat it. I could even tell myself I'm smelling it. And I could fill in all the blanks of what that experience would be like. But it's not quite the same as just it instantly pops into my mind that I can visually see things and stuff. So I I think, yes, I I mean, I know I can see myself picking it up, feeling it, knowing that it's there's crumbs coming off of it, that there's oil on my fingers, you know, all the visualization aspects of it. But I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not sure how you feel something when your body isn't there, you know? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So it sounds like it's mainly visual for you and the yeah. other senses are kind of meshed in with the visual aspect of it. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, I'm just trying to decide how realistic that is supposed to be. I mean, I definitely, I definitely interact with these visions or these images, you know, where I'm doing things with me, even in my dreams, I do this in my dreams too. Like I have really, really vivid dreams and I'll see myself doing things in my dreams where when I'm awake, I don't ever see myself. It's just like, I'm there, like it's really happening to me, but it's not quite the full experience of reality, obviously where you're, you know, yeah, you can have contact on skin or anything like that. In this episode, we will be referring to what we call the nature picture. If you would like to view the nature picture to play along and better understand what we're talking about, you can find it on shanesbraindomain.com in the Aphantasia and Beyond section. If you are unable to take a look at the nature picture, it is a picture of a grove of tall trees with the sun shining brightly through the trees. There is a blue camping chair next to a peaceful flowing river with a campfire nearby. All right, the next thing I'd like you to do is take a look at that nature picture that I sent you. Okay. Can you put yourself in that picture? Yeah, for sure. That's Can interesting, see... yeah, that you said. Can you see yourself there? Yeah. Can you feel the sun on your skin? I mean, yes. It's really interesting how these things play out. Like, uh, so let, yes, I can, but <clears throat> I think I can because it's something I focus on all the time. It's an interesting question that you asked me because I, the feeling sun on my skin is just one of my favorite things. And so I've really relished in that experience. So that's like a really easy one for me to like, yes, I can see myself there 
feeling it and enjoying it on my skin yet. Uh, can you hear the river flowing? Yes. Can you smell the campfire at all? It's, I mean, I've, I've never done this exercise where I try to include senses, but if I try, I can, you know, I guess if I, if I think about it, it's like, I can bring into the space, just like I do in visualization, all the things that a sense, my senses would experience, but I have to kind of consciously do that because you're asking me to. Okay. Can you sit in the chair? Yeah. All right. Uh, again, if you can just describe how real, how close to reality that all of those experiences were. I would say it's about as real as it would be if you were watching a movie of yourself doing that, but you weren't the one that made the movie, you know? Okay. So if I had made the movie myself, then I would have memories of those experiences and it would, I think, feel more real. But because I never actually did it, it's almost like you created a video using an avatar that looked just like you or something. So I can see myself walking there in whatever form, you know, and then sitting down and smelling the campfire, all of the things. It's like watching a movie that I, something of something I've never actually experienced. Oh, cool. That is a great description. Out of the five senses, which one would you say is the most prominent or powerful in your mind? Yeah, without question, visually, just seeing it all is by far the strongest and comes easily to me. But um, okay. I feel like I have to kind of think about all the others and add them in. Gotcha. In general, when you close your eyes, what do you see? Depends on what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I mean, if, if I close my eyes, I almost have to think harder about the fact that there's nothing there. Like if I close my eyes and I'm, I'm like, okay, there's just blackness there. Like I I'll, I'll actually get distracted and be like, oh, and I can see a little light out of the corner or whatever, but I'm trying to focus on the fact that nothing's there way more often than not. When I'm closing my eyes, I'm doing things like a video in my head. I'm designing a room, a space that I have to do. Like I'm like, this is a good example. I have a home that I'm staging today. And I am on staging one home and starting to stage another home. And I want to make sure everything in this other home, the old home, will work in the new space. So I'll close my eyes and think of every room in the old house and what furniture is there, what art is on the walls, what rugs I used, what accent pieces are there. And then I try to transfer them to the new space and picture them on the walls there picture them, the rugs, everything. Will they coordinate with the light fixtures? Will they fit in the space? Are they, you know, and so I'm just really playing out visual things in my mind all the time. Okay. So would you say that you're always visualizing? There's always something visual happening in your mind? Most of the time, a good 99% of the time, probably I'm visualizing something. So I, I think I know the answer to this. Next question. Can you think of nothing if you want to? It is hard. Like meditation is really hard for me. It ends up being a, a constant battle of pushing images out of my mind so that I can focus on the nothingness that you're supposed to focus on. <laughs> so me and my sisters, we used to get together on all of our birthdays to do whatever the person's birthday that it was going to be wanted to do, whatever that was. And we all had to be on board with it. And I think it was actually my birthday that I wanted to do a meditation. And so my sister Buffy said, oh, I know this person that is so good at doing guided meditation. She's like a guru. She studied it her whole life. And I don't know if you know what Buffy does, but she works with the elderly, people who have Alzheimer's, people who are in rest homes. And so she said, she's retired now. She's in a rest home. I care for her, but she would, you know, do a guided meditation for us. And so we all show up in our yoga gear to go to a rest home, which is not where you normally do a meditation. <laughs> And we all trudge up to her private room <laughs> instead of a, you know, an exercise space. So we walk in and she's just, you know, come in and sit on her bed. We're sitting on her bed on the floor, all these places, you know, and we start this guided meditation. And she's like, which I'd never done before. I wasn't really familiar with what that was or how it worked or whatever. And so she's like, close your eyes and just imagine that you are out in nature and you're about to start a hike. She's like, you can picture yourself with, you know, being all comfortable and relaxed. You're excited. It's a beautiful day. And you're starting on this hike and you're noticing all the beautiful things around you. So as we're going on this hike, she's telling us to notice flowers, trees, plants, you know, 
the the slope increases slightly, your heart rate increases slightly. And I'm like really invested. I'm in that space. I'm seeing it. And we're going along and all of a sudden she says, and and then just out of nowhere, this man starts walking towards you. And I'm just thinking, wait a minute, like what's happening? That's not what's supposed to happen on my guided meditation. And she said, oh, and he is gorgeous <laughs> and she's like he is so muscly and I'm just thinking we're like kind of looking at open her eyes like, are you seeing this are you all seeing this and then she's like and he, as he walks towards you you become more and more fluttered and distracted his shirt is off and his skin is glistening I mean she's just going into this gory detail and she's this old old lady and I'm just thinking please like stop you're making me see indecent things in my mind just stop and then she says, and you're so distracted that you step incorrectly on a rock and break your ankle. <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all at this point just laughing and giggling and struggling to keep our eyes closed. But I'm still like, I got to see what happens. I got to keep going. I need to see what happens next. And so <laughs> she's like, he rushes to your side. He picks you up. He carries you down the trail. And the whole time I'm just thinking, what is the point of this? Is she trying to get the heart rate up? You know, <laughs> she's trying to get things racing in our mind. But before, you know, before she could finish, we were all just in a pile laughing on the floor. We didn't get very far in the meditation. It was just hilarious. And I still don't know if it was because she got bored or she's old and senile and she just needed something a little more interesting happening in her version of the story. I don't know, but it was pretty funny. It's time for you Fantasia, the part of the show that lets you chime in and share your thoughts, insights, and experiences. Today we have Tony chiming in. Today's question is, is there always something audible or visual going on in your mind? There are words in my head. I think of words. I think of things that I'm saying to myself, talking to myself. That's what's going on in my mind. If you would like to participate and hear yourself featured on the podcast, go to shanesbraindomain.com and click on the You Fantasia section. Okay. Uh, do you think your ability to visualize varies depending on different circumstances or events or details yeah it really does i i was thinking about this a lot um just this morning when i was getting ready for this and and i was thinking that i have deliberately tried to block out of my mind certain things i think people do that sometimes especially if you have trauma in your life and i have deliberately tried to not think about and forget about certain things and i was listening to a video right before we started this where it was asking you to remember certain things from your childhood. And I realized I have giant gaps in my childhood. There's things that I don't remember, things that I cannot visualize. I can't remember the way that it looked. I can't see that space and, and it's unpleasant to try and see it. And so it's, it just really hinders my visual ability to see things I don't want to see. And, and I was thinking about that, that I think I think there's got to be at least some people who don't spend a lot of time in their own mind visualizing things and sorting through things and and possibly because they don't like what they see there. They don't like what's in their mind, their memories or their way they see themselves, the way they feel about themselves or things that they struggle with in their mind. Um, I think it could get in the way. I think there's a lot of psychology in doing this. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you tend to visualize things you've already seen before? Or do you tend to create new and unique images in your mind? Both. Yeah. Okay. I really Can like to create on that? new things. Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> well, one thing that I love to do with my grandson is we tell stories to each other and together we combine stories. And so I'll start a story and, you know, give them beginning of the story, get to an interesting point, And then I stop and then let, I let him finish and fill in the gap. And then we, because we're taking turns, we both have to pick up where the other person left off. And so we, I, I'm constantly trying to create images in his mind by what I'm describing. So I'll describe things that are not there, have never been there, you know, and and see where he takes it, what what becomes of it once he has that portion of the story. But I think visualizing things that aren't there is a huge plays a huge role in designing new things that have never been designed and creating art that's never been you know created before, engineering things, solving problems, and and so I do that a lot, like 
I'm really big on landscaping. <laughs> Not, I didn't used to be. And we bought a home four years ago that had no landscaping. And I just knew I wanted it to be different than what everybody else had. And so I just started imagining what I wanted my yard to look like and creating plans and ideas. Well, the problem with that is a lot of the things I wanted are things no one else has done before. And so I had to visualize in my mind how to create the things I wanted. Like I have a giant concrete wall in the front of our house and I wanted there to be imprinted circles on the wall, but the concrete people had never done that. They didn't know how. And so I got some big thick pieces of foam and cut the circles into shapes and had them bolt it to the frame. So when the concrete came in, there was the absence of space in the circles. So the circles are imprinted in. Found out later, lots of people do that. Just these people had not done that. So I had to sort it out in my mind and figure out how to do that. When you're picturing these things, would you say that they kind of have a mind of their own? Like, where do they come from? I don't think they have a mind of their own. I I mean, so, so I want to do these concrete orbs, um, big, huge concrete orbs. And I've been going through it in my mind over and over and over and over the best way to do that. And each time I, I go through the process of creating it and then put it in the space I want it and try to see what are going to be the obstacles or the problems that will make that not work. And so when I come across an issue that isn't going to work, then I have to go back to the drawing board. And I literally, in my mind, go back to the beginning and think of what's a different way that I could solve this problem. If I were going to create the orb using a different material, how would that affect the weight of it? If I made it hollow, would that make it more likely to crack or break? And all of those things in my mind, I'm seeing it happen as I'm bringing in the, you know, the the mathematical or the the um, physics of it or whatever. I'm trying to apply pressures and things in my mind to see what could be potential problems in the future and then avoid those before I ever actually pour concrete. Okay. So it's very creative, but it's also very logical. Yeah. Logical and in my control. There's, I, right. I don't feel like it's not like a dream where things are happening that you wish weren't happening. <laughs> right. It's just, it's happening because I want it to, or because I'm, you know, make it happen. Okay. All right. Lots of good stuff in here. So let's talk about reading. When you read a novel, is it like a movie in your mind or something else? Yeah, it is like a movie. In fact, I would say because of the element of control, it's like watching a movie that you can manipulate. So uh, quite often I'll, you know, be hearing this story and there's a detail I don't like, so I change it. Or there's something interesting that I want to know more about. So I will kind of stop listening and go off in a different direction in my mind to expand on that aspect of the story, you know? So I kind of embellished audiobooks and, and you know, books. So how well can you visualize the characters in the surroundings? Really well, yeah. What type of detail? Like, can you see, you know, skin tones, wrinkles in the skin? Like, how detailed is it? Yeah, definitely all of those things. And I think I kind of lean my, what I visualize to my preference. So I kind of see almost like HD versions of things like high definition versions of things where I, because I'm a photographer, I really love the the play of light on objects, shadows and light and contrast, you know, so I realize that in my mind, I am almost always seeing some measure of light and shadow playing across whatever it is that I'm watching and yeah, just other, other things. I'm really emotional. And so I always play, put emotion into everything. Like when I'm hearing a story, I'm thinking about how does this person feel about what just happened? And so when I see their face, I see it with an expression that would display how they're feeling about what just happened. Oh, very cool. That would be so fun to do. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, it is what, what about the sounds when you're reading? Do you hear the sounds and voices in your mind? Yeah, that's interesting too because it's it's not familiar voices. You know, I I don't I don't hear my husband's voice whenever a man is speaking. You know, I don't hear familiar voices. They're just a voice that I would attribute to that character, and they may be somewhere back in my subconscious, something I saw in a movie somewhere or something. I feel like a person with this face would have this voice, kind of thing. Oh, okay. So when you're reading a book, is there any narration that happens in your mind? From myself? Do I narrate beyond the narrator? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> but I don't feel like it comes as a narration. I feel like if a book 
has that, or sometimes they're describing a scene, I let that voice be the narration. I feel like more often than not, I prefer just to be in it like I'm there. Like no one's, no, there's no big voice in the sky narrating over what's happening. It's, I'm experiencing it as if I were there. Perfect. All right. You talked about uh, audiobooks, that you love audiobooks. Do you like audiobooks better than reading books? Uh, I do now. I I used to read a lot and then life hits you hard and you get so busy. And then, so I didn't read for a really long time because I was so busy. I just never had time to sit down and read. And then I discovered audiobooks and I discovered that I can do that while I'm doing everything else. And it it takes my mind away from all the mindless tasks that I'm doing like doing laundry and getting ready in the morning and doing dishes and things like that. So while my body's kind of on autopilot doing these things, I'm deep in whatever it is that I'm listening to and I'm visualizing it and I'm thinking about it, which makes those, those mundane experiences, not so, you know, boring because I'm, I'm actually doing something far more interesting in my mind. So would you say that the visualization experience is the same, whether you're reading it or listening to it? I don't think so, because I think when I'm reading something myself, there's always some amount of focus that has to go into actually reading. You know, you're looking at the pages, you have to focus on the next word. So even though I can imagine it, I feel like it's kind of crutched a little bit because I'm having to direct focus to the process of reading. And when it's, I'm just hearing it in an audiobook. I don't have to do any of that work. And so I can just get lost. It's kind of like daydreaming with a script, like a movie script. You know, I, I just see it all play it out in my head as they feed it to me and I expand on it. It just gives me a lot more freedom and creativity in my mind when I'm not having to actually read it. What do you do to fall asleep? Not much. I am so busy. I can hit, hit, put my head on the, the, pillow and I'm out in seconds. I just fall asleep really quickly. Okay. That's interesting because when I asked you, you know, about closing your eyes and if there's always something going on in your head, you said, yeah, it's, there's always something happening. So a lot of times with people like that, they have a hard time getting to sleep, but it sounds like it may just be more a physical thing with you where you're just exhausted. And Yeah. Cause when I was younger, I had that problem a lot. I couldn't go to sleep because there were just so many ideas running through my mind, just so many things I wanted to be doing and focusing on just every imaginable thing. I just couldn't shut it off. And I really did have a hard time falling asleep. And I tried all of those things, counting sheep and visualize, you know, honestly, the thing that worked the best was to focus on the blackness, to force myself to look at the backs of my eyelids, to think of myself in a blank room to not think about anything. And then I'd get so bored, I'd fall asleep. (laughs) But uh, now that I'm so tired, just so exhausted, I I really just fall asleep really quickly without having to do anything. So since you mentioned counting sheep, what is that like for you? Okay, I'll tell you what my trouble was with counting sheep. So I would close my eyes and I try to imagine counting sheep, but I would picture them as they are in a field, so many sheep, and they don't stay in one place, they're moving around. You know, you'd count a few and so then they'd move around and you can't remember if you counted that one yet or not. And so then I was having to like herd them, like get out of the way. I've counted you already. You go over there, count the next one, count the next one, count the next one, you know. But then I would always get distracted by the variations of the sheep, you know, that oh that one's so cute and little, he's so cute. You know, <laughs> that's like a dirty, filthy ram. Why are you here? Get out of my mind, you know. Like just <laughs> You know, I and, and then before I knew it, I was just thinking so much again that I wasn't falling asleep. I am so glad that came up. That's one of the best <laughs> things I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh, man. How vivid and detailed are your dreams? Very, very vivid and detailed. In fact, I they always come with a lot of emotion, like I said. Um, uh, lots of detail, lots of emotion, and they seem and feel so real that quite often I wake up and it haunts me or continues. I continue to think about it even years and years and years later sometimes, uh, because it felt like a real experience. Like it really happened. Like I, I always try to psychoanalyze it and, you know, like, so, so yeah, they're very real. In fact, what I notice is if I have a dream that I don't like the way it ended or I get interrupted, I w- wake up before it's completed. I will lay there and finish the dream in my mind because I I can't just leave off where it was, you know? So I 
lay there with my eyes closed and I continue the dream awake until it comes to a, a conclusion that I can be okay with. Oh, wow. So how well do you remember your dreams? Most of the time, really well, like really, really well. It depends on how much, how, you know, how important the dream was, or if it was something I thought was worth remembering, you know, just like you forget a movie, you don't care to watch that much, but remember your favorite movie, you know. Do you think there's a correlation between how well you remember your dreams and how vivid your dreams are? Yeah, definitely. All right, let's talk about memory. If you want to recall a memory, can you see it in your mind? Most of the time, yeah. Can you relive the memory like you're experiencing it all over again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Can you feel the emotions of those memories? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Do you experience the memories in first person, third person, or both? I think first person most of the time. I was there, so I'm reliving it as if I were there. All right. How would you describe how your mind stores information? Honestly, really through memory. It's like I, okay, so associations. That's something that uh, has helps me remember things that I have a hard time remembering so much. I remember in high school, I was learning Spanish words and the word pupitre came up. Do you know what that is in Spanish? <laughs> no. It's so, it's, it means desk. And I couldn't remember. I was having a hard time remembering that word. And so I had to visualize my desk as a desk with a poopy tray on the desk, <laughs> a tray covered in poop. And it was really disgusting, but I've never forgotten it. <laughs> and I feel like I, I do that with a lot of things when I, I need to remember someone's names, especially I visualize something that was an association. And so when I need to remember it again, I think of the association and it helps me remember I've taught that my kids that a lot when they were studying for tests. I, in my grandson, like he always flips the B's and D's. He's in kindergarten. And so I told him a B is first a back and then a belly. You just see a long straight back and then you see it has like a little belly, you know? And so I'd have him close his eyes and picture that. And then I said, the D is a donut with a dog's tail. So you see this little round donut first and then something sticking straight up and that's a dog's tail. And so that's how you can tell the difference between your B's and D's. And so in my mind, I saw those things and that's how I remember. And he hasn't flipped those two while I've been doing homework with him since then. I think it helps to remember by visualization. Okay. So do you associate your mind with an area or a space? I, the universe. I can be anywhere. I can do anything. The world is my oyster, oyster in my mind. Okay. So are there different rooms or compartments in your mind at all? Yeah, that's a good point. I never think of like, I you know, like I have a storage room where all that stuff is stored or a, yeah, I definitely don't compartmentalize things and, but they just come as needed, whatever it is I'm thinking about from nowhere, apparently. Boom, they're there. So again, one of the little sayings we have in our society is uh, search your mind. Can you do that? What does search your mind mean to you? Yeah. So I, like, especially if I'm being asked to remember something that I have forgotten or, you know, like somebody's name or whatever, then I will go back and try to replay moments like when I was introduced to the person or a time that I had to use their name or an association that I made with their name, you know, or just just anything that might jog my memory. So there's definitely missing information. I'm not I, I don't have a great memory, actually, and I'm terrible with names. But if I could go back and replay things that would jog my memory, then it will come back to me. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about your specifics. Um, I know we talked in the beginning a little bit about uh, what you do for work and how that, how the visualization plays a role. Uh, but anything else in that realm, um, how your visualization, how your mind works, helps you in your career or your hobbies? Well, for in photography, for instance, I would always create the picture in my mind before I created it in, in real life. And when you're working with people, that's kind of an interesting thing to do because the way that a person stands can be very flattering or unflattering and layering people is a way to make someone look thinner. And then you want the background behind them to look like a painting, like that they were standing with just close enough to the tree 
just with enough, you know, greenery behind them, all of those things. And so if you have someone standing there waiting for you to move them to the right, move them to the left, try this, try that, that's very annoying for people. So I would just very quickly look at them, imagine the picture the way that it ought to be and move everyone and everything into that position and then take the picture. And so, and I do that with staging as well. I look at a room and picture it completely staged. And if that couch doesn't work, I switch it out in my mind, that one, that one, I'll rifle through my inventory and then find the couch that fits the space perfectly. And then I know that's the one I need to pick up when I bring it. And I do the same thing when I go through stores. Um, I'm taking a mental inventory of anything I think would be cute or useful, the things that they carry. So when I'm staging home, if, if I don't have the thing I need, I already know where it is and what store it's at that will look good in that space. I kind of keep a mental inventory of not just the items themselves, but how they go well together, how they coordinate, you know, sets of things. So like, I don't have it written down anywhere. Like I have, I have enough furniture to stage 10 homes and I've purchased enough things that coordinate well with each other and go well with each other that they, you know, um, uh, are very versatile, but I typically keep them in, you know, kind of groupings. And then when I come to a house that has a different color scheme, I know what I need to flip out of that group setting to get something else in, you know, and all of that just happens in my mind. I don't have a computer file or anything for that stuff. Right. Yeah. That sounds like that would be extremely helpful. And it makes me think, do you think you could do your job if you had a foundation? I don't know. I mean, I think I, I could, but I think I would have to supplement my, the way that I do things with something more, concrete. So I, I work with another, another stager occasionally, and she sent me her inventory listed. It's a spreadsheet that has every item that she has and, you know, where it is and what she partners them with, and just a lot of information about her inventory. And I keep thinking, oh, that would be so helpful. I should have that. I should, you know, do that. But I haven't because I, I kind of just have it in my mind. But the problem with that is if I had to give it to somebody else, they could never do what I do because they can't see what I'm seeing in my mind. They would have to go look through everything I have and start from scratch, you know. So I think if I had a Fantasia, I would have to have other things that I could draw from to do the same thing. Okay. Like sketches. I think a lot of designers use sketches. They draw it out and I don't do that. I just do it all in my mind. But as far as staging goes, <clears throat> that's, I think the reason I'm in business is because so many people can't do it. That's the number one thing that I hear when an agent calls me to stage a home is all we're hearing from people is they can't picture themselves in this space. They don't think their furniture would fit in here. The room looks too small to be a usable space, you know, things like that. And so I can go and just walk into the room and say, yeah, definitely a twin size bed will fit in this space. You'll have an extra space over here for a dresser. And people just can't, can't do that. And without someone putting it physically in the space, they just pass on the house because they can't see themselves there. Yeah, because yeah. what I've discovered is everyone's so unique that um, even though most people are answering, you know, six on the Apple graph, when you get into the details, all of a sudden there's a bazillion differences, right? Wow. And so um, when we talk about being able to visualize depending on different circumstances, I mean, that that arises all the time. You know, they may be highly visual in other in other aspects, but for some reason, when it comes to picturing furniture in a room, they can't do it, right? And there's yeah. no real logical explanation for it. Yeah. Well, uh, another thing I've noticed is aspect ratios of things. So when I first started and wasn't very familiar with couches and, you know, the space of a room and things like that, I did a lot of measuring, measuring for the rugs, measuring for the couches making sure things would fit in the space because I wasn't very familiar with that. And I haven't done that for a really long time because now I'm so familiar with it. I can just walk in and say, yes, an eight by 10 rug will fit in this space. A 70 inch couch will fit in this space, you know? And so I think that the more you have experience with things, it adds to your arsenal of, of not just what you can visualize, but the literal aspect ratio of those things, you know, right. I can, just kind of guesstimate a room just by looking at it. And I think contractors and stuff must be doing that. I, I mean, I would think, or interior designers, but if not, they get out their tape measure and they go <laughs> measure every time, I guess. So did you do well in school or did you struggle? 
that's a loaded question <laughs> because of my specific school experience. But I think I did really well on the things that I I studied for the most part. Yeah. So do you think that your visualization abilities played a role? Oh, definitely. Um, in fact, I feel like that is the only way that I learned anything is because I see it and then play it over and over and over in my mind like a flashcard. And I could make associations that made it easier for me to recall it later and remember it later. And so we were homeschooled ish, not really. <laughs> so we just did not get a normal traditional education period. In fact, I didn't go to public school until I was in high school and only for non-required classes. And so a lot of our learning really was up to us. And I remember being so afraid that I wouldn't learn anything that as a really young child, we kind of taught each other to read and learn some basic, you know, phonics and, you know, things early, early on. And then after that, we just kind of had to learn and grow on our own. And I think that's where my insatiable need to learn and study things came from. But I remember being so afraid of not learning that I had a, a dictionary and I was reading words. I had no idea what they were and trying to figure out how to say them and memorizing them and learning. And so I was just going through as a small child, going through this dictionary, trying to learn words that I probably would never need or never use, struggling to remember them. And the way I did that is I would stare at it until I could see it in my head and just throughout the day, play it in my head throughout the day. And I did that with almost every subject. Like in math, I learned to do math on my own. Even now today, I will sit just, spit. it's a kind of creepy, maybe we're outside doing all of these um, measurements for cutting and things that we're building. And I just kind of stare off because I'm seeing it in my mind, the fractions, how they go together and corners, what angle they need to be cut at and things like that. I'm just kind of visually seeing it all in my mind and solving either the mathematical problem itself or just without using math, how it would physically come together. All right. So on that note, I'm going to give you a little test. I want to see, I want to know your process okay. to solve these. Okay. So the first one is, can you spell the word stormy backwards? Yes, but I'll definitely have to think about it. Y-M-C-R-O-T-S. Okay. Correct. What, what was your yeah. process? What was happening in your mind? I saw the word in front of me and just looked at the letters backwards. All right. Next one. Uh, what is 28 plus 47? <laughs> 28 plus 47. So I'll tell you instead of the process that I would have to go through to do this. So okay. I'd have to picture them together. And then because I didn't learn like normal people, there's no like memorization of those facts for me. So you said 28 and 47. So I would visualize the eight and the seven above each other. And then I would put the one that's easy for me to do together. The the 14 and then add one. So 15. And then I'd have to, in my mind, carry over the one. And then I've got a two and a four. And so that's six. And then, then I'd put the seven and then put those numbers together. All right. Here's one more. What states border Iowa? Iowa. Oh, wow. That is not my strong point. I don't know. Because I, you know, weirdly, I have been to like 32, 36 or something states. So, but I haven't been to Iowa and I haven't been to any of the states around there and thing. I mean, you can only bring up in your mind things that you've either, especially when in relation to something that is actual and factual, like where states are, you know, you can't just make that up. Like you would create a, a monster or a fairy tale creature or something in your mind. It has to match reality. And so if you've right. never seen it, you don't know what, what the right answers are. Okay. Last question. And this is just kind of a catch all. If you were to try to give a general description of how your mind works and what you see in your mind's eye, how would you describe it? I would say kind of like an encyclopedia of my experiences and my, you know, exposure to things in video form, sort of, you know, uh, kind of like I'm sure you've seen in sci-fi kind of movies, they have the big screen that they pull up and they can just touch it and it kind of creates a hologram in the room or something where, it shows the world and they have that in Star Wars and things like that. You know, I kind of feel like it's like that for me. Like I call up information and it pops out in front of me and I sort through the information in front of me and manipulate that information and then swipe it away to the next thing. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. It was fantastic. All right. Well, thanks so much again for asking me to do it. I had a lot of fun and I've learned a lot and I'm going to keep looking into it. I look forward to hearing your podcast. I'll be following up. 
If you like what you hear, please subscribe, follow, and engage with us, and share it with your friends and family as we continue to explore this fascinating subject. For additional information about this episode or Shane's Brain, check out the show notes. Thanks for listening to the Discovering Your Mind podcast. You are beautifully unique.